I'm Kusha Karvandi, and you're listening to Exerscribe Radio, the source for biohacking your health to reach your full potential. I created Exerscribe to provide people with a roadmap to working out. With our new workout app, you can get a custom workout program that adapts your workouts to your body type, goals, sleep quality, stress levels, and personal preferences. With live chat support, our workout app has become so comprehensive some call it a personal trainer in your pocket. Our users are seeing over 90% success rates with their goals because we take the neural approach to fitness, meaning we integrate movements and exercises that recalibrate your brain and body to prime you for rapid strength gains and fat loss. Check out the Exoscribe workout app in the iTunes app store today. In today's podcast, I interviewed Dr. Kelly Sturette. Kelly Sturette is a coach, physical therapist, author, speaker, and creator of the blog Mobility Wad. Mobility Wad has revolutionized how athletes think about human movement and athletic performance. His 2013 release of Becoming a Supple Leopard has become a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. Mobility Wad was voted number four in Outside Magazine's Top 10 Fitness Blogs of 2011, Breaking Muscle's Top 10 Fitness Blogs of 2011, and Healthline's Top 100 Health Blogs of 2011. Kelly and his work have been featured in Tim Ferriss' 4-Hour Body, Competitor Magazine, Inside Triathlon, Outside Magazine, Details Magazine, Power Magazine, and the CrossFit Journal. He teaches the wildly popular CrossFit Movement and Mobility Trainer course and has been a guest lecturer at the American Physical Therapy Association Annual Convention, Google, the Perform Better Summit, the Special Operations Medical Association Annual Conference, Police Departments, and Elite Military Groups Nationwide. Coach Kelly Surrett received his Doctor of Physical Therapy in 2007 from Samuel Merritt College in Oakland, California. Before starting his own physical therapy practice at San Francisco CrossFit, one of the first 50 CrossFit affiliates, he practiced performance-based physical therapy at the world-renowned Stone Clinic. In his current practice, Kelly continues to focus on performance-based orthopedic sports medicine with an emphasis on returning athletes to elite-level sport and performance. Kelly's clients have included Olympic gold medalists, Tour de France cyclists, world and national record-holding Olympic lifting and power athletes, CrossFit game medalists, ballet dancers, military personnel, and competitive age division athletes. Hey everyone, we're here on Extra Scribe Radio with the author of the best-selling New York Times best-selling book, Becoming a Supple Leopard, Dr. Kelly Sturett. Welcome, Kelly. Hey, thanks, man. So just to get us started, could you tell the audience a little bit about you and your background? Oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. If we go back, I grew up in Europe. I was on a traveling folk dance troupe. Most people don't know that about me. No, uh, you know, the short story is if, you know, over, I'm a physical therapist. I have a doctor in physical therapy. And over the last, you know, 10 years, we've owned a strength and conditioning center in San Francisco called San Francisco CrossFit. And, you know, we were one of the early adopters of CrossFit. I think if you go down the list right now, we're number 27 on the list. And, you know, the reason that's relevant is that at CrossFit was the first time I had run into a strength and conditioning system that was asking me to express really full range of motion, the full physiologic range of motion that I needed to, uh, that we didn't see in some of these other disciplines. Cause I was riding my bike and I was running, but I wasn't in the shape of the pistol. I wasn't snatching. I wasn't spending a lot of time in this internal rotation. You know, I w I'd been following Pavel for a long time and even Dan John, I was overhead squatting in my local gym, you know, like metal plates overhead going for it. And one of the things we noticed about the, I mean, obviously I had sort of holes in my belt metabolic capacity that were just self-evident right away. But I also had to develop the skill and make sure that I had sort of the, all of these available ranges to be competent, just to be able to do sort of the programming. And, and intensity aside, I'm talking about this the first time where I was like, holy crap, I, this is a highly skilled strength and conditioning system, and I'm not very skilled. And so suddenly I was in front of Mike Bergner, spent a ton of time with him. I was with all these powerlifters. I was doing the fundamentals of bodyweight control gymnastics. You know, I was reading everything that, you know, Jeff Martone put out about kettlebells and, and it really just gave me this breadth of understanding. I ran into Brian McKenzie, it turned out I didn't even know how to run correctly. And so all of a sudden I started to become a lot more competent at the language, the formal language of being human personally. And, you know, I, I had a, another life as a professional athlete and was re injury retired. Basically I paddled on the national team and then my right hand went numb from overuse. 
and you know, no one could really tell me why. And they said it was very common. And so all of a sudden I had this, I realized that the things that I was doing to be prepared to be on the national team were just not woefully inadequate. Then I'm in physio school and I start CrossFit, open our gym. And what ended up happening is I started seeing patterns at a volume that would have taken me a hundred years as a physio. What am I talking about? Well, since we've been open, for example, we have done roughly give or take 5,000 or 10,000, uh, a hundred thousand athlete sessions. That's a hundred thousand athlete hours, which is a lot of people squatting up and down, a lot of people performing basic hip hinges, a lot of people pressing over their head, a lot. So, you know, what we saw was we started to collect these very, very simple patterns and understand that what we were seeing is that people came in with big aerobic engines, big anaerobic engines, they're very strong people, but their movement quality was terrible. And that, that also was the same pattern I was seeing when I was looking at dysfunction as a physical therapist in my physio practice. And it hatched on me one day, I was working on this very, you know, I have to be honest, you know, I feel like when I started this, no one was mobilizing to improve performance. No one. I mean, maybe you did a little myofascial roll, right? And, and maybe you rolled on a tennis ball once in a while, you know, a foam roller. But we really, when I started, when I was working at this very Shishi orthopedic clinic, this MMA fighter came in. And uh, he was talking about his problem with his guard and his back. And I was like, let me show you something. And I, I showed him that he did not have full hip flexion capacity. And so I started mobilizing his hips. And he came back and was like, oh, my God, I just crushed that guy. My guard was more effective. And what ended up happening is I started seeing, hey, just because we're doing it and we don't have full physiologic range, that's the problem. And so we started really kind of working towards restoring people's ranges and making them more immaculate and sort of robust. And in that context, we were also making them injury proof. All of a sudden our, you know, you, you didn't have shoulder pain, but you're missing overhead range. Well, you know, that's the same pattern I was seeing in soldiers wearing body armor in the Marines. And, you know, we T spine restored the overhead position and impingement went away, right? Obviously. But instead of waiting until all of these things blew up on our faces, we were getting ahead of it. And that's really sort of the genesis of becoming a self leopard. And I remember coming home to my wife one day and saying, Hey, you know, why, why is it that anyone doesn't know this? Like you should not have to fly in from Hong Kong as an elite athlete and then pay me a lot of money to tell you that your quads are stiff and you're, you know, and you, you don't have point of motion in your shoulders. I mean, like, what are we even doing? That's not even a good use of my time. That's certainly not a good use of your time. So we started a video project. We we're going to make a video a day about all the things that we thought every human being should know about how they work and how they're supposed to move. Because remember, the movement physiology is not debatable. We know what the best position for the shoulder is, and it reflects itself in all of these movements and all of the things that we do. So it doesn't matter if you're a pitcher. It doesn't matter if you're you know, playing soccer. It doesn't matter if you, you, know, if you ski or a bike. Like the shoulder is the shoulder is the shoulder. And so when we started seeing that, then we, what I ended up doing is understanding that the strength and conditioning was making the invisible visible. It was very simple for me to see range of motion restrictions in my gym lab that I couldn't necessarily see at full speed in someone's sport. For example, um, you know, the ACL tear in women is like the plague for professional athletes and, and even collegiate athletes. Like we have not budged the ACL injury rate in women in 20 years. It's, it's a disaster. In fact, there's a hospital in San Francisco uh, uh, operating room UCSF that literally could be booked 24 hours a day doing ACL injury surgeries on kids under 14, which is just insane. Wow. So, you know, if we have the, you know, women are tearing their ACLs at almost five times the rate of men in college. And what we said is, look, oh, yeah, it's hormones, you're a girl, it's totally normal. Like what a bunch of horse crap it is. And as we kind of, you know, drill down on that, why is that happening? Why can't we stop it? Why can't we see it? And the problem is we're not understanding what we're seeing in the gym. Our answer has always been get fitter, get stronger, not, hey, let's teach you more robust mechanics. And so, you know, for men, you know, the equivalent injury, I think, is the, is the Achilles strain or the Achilles tear, right? The most dangerous sport for middle-aged men is playing pickup basketball with their buddies. Like, if you're in your 30s, you go play, you're asking for it. But if you are asked to regularly express full range of motion in your ankles, you know, from overhead squatting, from doing pistols, from performing high box jumps, from these kinds of things, 
guaranteed you, you will come up against the fact that you don't have a full range of motion in your ankles, that your tissues are stiff, that your mechanics suck. And when you address those things, you will never tear your, your Achilles on the basketball court. And that's, that's sort of how we got to where we are. And then, you know, it turns out that everyone likes to go fast. And the way that we started making this matter to people is that we started getting people to understand that, hey, if you improve your mechanics, you improve your force production, you improve your efficiency, you improve your economy, and those things are reflected in your work output, time, wattage, it doesn't matter. And there's a side effect of making that deal for performance, we become injury proof. I love it. I, I, love that, the, I love the science just my, behind it. Yeah, and that's just my opinion. You know, whatever. <laughs> so you, you did Becoming a Supple Leopard, but now you're working on a new book, Ready to Run. Tell me about that. Well, what I saw was, um, you know, running, we finally started, you know, because of the influence, you know, Nikolai Romanoff is like a mentor, a friend, you know, Brian McKenzie, um, you know, is, is a huge influence on my capacity to run. And what we started realizing was that running is a skill just like any other skill, like deadlifting. In fact, I think running is more complex than Olympic lifting. It takes, you know, the problem is, you know, that we perform certain movements thousands of times a day without sort of thinking about them. One is because we're wired to be able to do it. And two is that we have this sort of genetic bounty that allows us to absorb poor positioning for literally decades and literally millions of reps until we fail or until we start to express that load under some intensity, i.e. speed. So it's okay if I walk like a duck, right, and clasp my feet and wear a high heel shoe, a shoe with a you know, centimeter differential. And then all of a sudden when I start running, oh, well, that starts to create problems in my ankles and problems in my plantar fascia and problems in my heels and knees. And, and if I'm always sitting and my anterior hip gets very short, then all of a sudden I can't express the hip extension required to run. That means I have to overstride and now I heel strike even worse. And I heel strike like a duck. And all of a sudden you can start to see that, well, if I'm three or four times body weight every stride and I take 400 steps every 400 meters, that's 800 loads at double body weight for me, which is, you know, close to, you know, two, 460 pounds times, you know, 400 loads in 800 meters. Good Lord. And you can see the math starts to become extraordinary. So what we started to see is, and just like, you know, our, our, so the central tenet of our idea is, hey, we're going to take best concepts of sport, the best concepts of performance, and if we can't spin those concepts backwards to affect those of us who are not professional athletes, those of us who are not, you know, make, using our body for living like soldiers, then, then sport is not a function of self-actualization. It's not a, a function of sort of peak human existence. It's just circus. And so what we started to do then was say, hey, look, let's give the running skill its due diligence. And as soon as we started looking at, do its due respect, as soon as we started looking at the running injuries rates, it's insane. Running is more dangerous than gymnastics or Olympic lifting or like fighting. Like it is so dangerous. If you knew, and that's injury rates per thousand hours. I mean, those are not my made up numbers. You know, the running industry is like a $4 billion industry. You know, the, run, red, the born to run revolution happened. And all of a sudden we were all like, hey, I'm in. I'll, I went and bought some, you know, flat shoes. I'm ready to go. And what we saw was that people were not prepared for the technique and did not have the biomechanics. And when we define mobility, the way I define mobility, it's really clear, is that it's understanding the motor control and having the requisite biomechanics. And so there are guys who have done a good job at managing technique and are really experts in that. Nikolai Romanoff with this pose method, Brian McKenzie, cross endurance, you know, just chi running for a couple. But what ends up happening is that we sort of don't also deal with that second estate, which is environment, right, and lifestyle, that people are dehydrated and they don't warm up and cool down. They're chronically inflamed. They, they exercise and then sit. So we have to address those things, those issues of sort of element of lifestyle. But the third domain is your simple biomechanics. And what we saw was that people did not have a reference to understand what we think are the requisite biomechanics. For example, if you cannot squat down with your feet together and keep your heels on the ground, you do not have full ankle and hip range of motion, period. 
And that's not extra crazy gymnastics range of motion. That's normal range of motion. And if you don't have normal or baseline hemodiolic range, then what's going to happen is you're going to end up making compromises in your movement patterns that are going to lead you to, yes, get the job done. Yes, maybe run fast you will get injured. And the first thing that we have to fix is your movement pattern and your biomechanics. And so what we found was in this book is that we created 12 standards, which we know it's a moving target. We know you're going to have kids and sit and, you know, and get interested in high level ping pong and then do something else crazy. And, you know, it's a moving target, but we should always be able to kind of come back, which is an idea we even share with Greg Cook about the functional movement screen. Look, the functional movement screen is not, designed to predict performance it's a baseline so we can measure changes over time and we can always sort of understand where we are and what we should be able to do and so if you run someone through the fms you should be like oh okay you know you're fine great keep an eye on it but you know we're trying to create those simple baselines for people in the language running so what we've done is again tried to simplify what we think has always felt like a very complex algorithm to take off what we think is the lowest hanging fruit around. You know, for example, we see that people don't have a template to go to flat running shoes. And so one of our ideas is, hey, we want you to be in a flat shoe or barefoot as much po- time as possible. So you know, we advocate for barefoot Saturday. See if you can spend the entire day barefoot. Walk around barefoot. You know, play barefoot. Just be barefoot. Make all your rest of your shoes barefoot or, barefoot or flat. Then go run in your running shoe that has a little differential. So we don't need to throw out your shoes yet. Let's get you flat. So we're going to buy you all this extra space, but then we'll run with some breathing room, some you know, additional crutch-like shoe. You should be able to run flat, but what we're seeing is that people don't have the sort of biomechanical language or availability to be able to get there. So instead, give me a template to be able to wean yourself off that high heel shoe but what we're going to do in the meantime is go ahead and keep your shoe the way it is and spend the rest of time barefoot. So that's, that's one of the, the concepts, for example. That's awesome. You know, one thing that's really interesting is I see neuroscience begin to make an entry into the fitness industry. Do you see any practical applications for a brain-based approach to fitness versus the direct body approach? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, here's the deal is that if, you, if you've read, you know, talent code, at the very least. You know, I don't know how many, science, how many semesters of, of neurobiology I had to take in grad school, but it was a ton, right? Is that if people understand the reason you have a nervous system is to move you through the environment. That's the only reason. Don't believe me? Um, you know, go ahead and tweak your back and tell me what happens to your, your desire to move, your fun, your desire to have sex. Like, we're tanks, right? Because your body triages that nervous system injury above, above all others. I mean, you can literally you know, um, cut off your leg and keep going. You know, all you have to do is watch, you know, Lone Survivor and understand how tough humans are, right? But if you injure your back or your neck, you're going to get shut down. So what we understand is that we have a nervous system that is designed to move us through the environment so we can reproduce, feed ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. Cognition is actually a later construct on, and it's layered on top of the brain. The neocortex is on top of the old brain, the new brain. And these are integrated systems. So we can't devolve or pull out sort of the intellectual construct of this. What we know is that when you perform a skill, remember, I have the raw conduits for my body. That's why I have glutes, because I'm designed to run. Like, literally, that's why I'm upright. I'm designed to run long distances. This is why you know, we're sort of wired the way we are. But if we look at skill acquisition as a complex biologic phenomenon, that the Schwanz, when I derive a movement pattern. Remember, these movement patterns are, are movement patterns. They're not muscular tissue patterns. You're not wired for any muscle or tissue in the body. You can't, you can't selectively control any muscle in your body. You can perform a movement that activates a muscle, but you're not wired to fire your pec minor. Go ahead, fuck your pec minor, I'll wait. You know? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, people, people are like, I have performance syndrome. I'm like, show me your performance. Point to it. I'm like, you have no idea where your performance is. You can't flex your performance. It's one of the short hip rotators. It's just like there's so much kind of crap out there around this. So what we see is that you end up in a movement pattern. Your brain says, okay, that's a pattern you're in all the time. That must be important. Let's reinforce it. So the myelination cells, the Schwann cells come in and reinforce that pattern with literally a physical construct called myelin. And that, that, that 
pathway starts to become more and more robust. That's why it's hard to break a pattern, right? Because it's our default neuromechanical, electrical neuromechanical, you know, highway. And so the issue is that practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And to sort of divorce ourselves from skill is an error. And, you know, why do people love soul cycles so much? Well, you get to go and be a piece of meat on an exercise bike. There's no technique required. You put your feet here, you move, you feel like you're going to die. High five. No skill at all involved in that. Zero. And, you know, I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying you don't have huge aerobic capacity, big lungs. I'm not saying you can't bleed from the eyes and effort. But there is zero skill involved with riding a bike like that for exercise. Versus picking something up, Pilates, yoga, dance, karate, CrossFit, powerlifting. What you're going to see is that we have to get people to have a movement practice. And that movement practice is not exercise. And we can load that movement practice and as a side effect, have exercise, right? Side effects become more fit. But the heart soul of this is we are using cardiorespiratory demand, metabolic demand, load, speed, stress, all of these ideas to challenge the robustness of your movement pattern. So, you know, when you run a 10K or a half marathon or marathon, what do people ask you? Well, how did you run? How did you look at the end? You know, was your technique good? Is that what they ask you? No, they're like, what was your time? And like anything else, all we value is how much weight is on the bar and how fast you got it done. And there's certainly a time to test our capacities. That's called the Olympics, right? That's called sporting game. But I still use that, that time to, I still evaluate those efforts to understand how I can become a more efficient athlete. So when we start, you know, really taking a look at, do you have a movement practice? That movement practice has an intellectual component, and good Lord, you are designed to move. And the second you sort of divorce yourself from that and only value your wattage or only value yes or no, the barbell is above my head, you've set yourself up for orthopedic disaster, for common misuse, and a lifetime of chronic pain. I mean, I, we've done this experiment ad infinitum. You know, one of the most interesting things is that I hear a lot of people talk about various various tissue manipulation techniques like trigger point, foam rolling, or whatever, to increase tissue quality. But what is exactly tissue quality? What does that mean? Well, here's, here's the way I think of it. One is that there's sort of two ways to go about. One is that you have to look at sort of the components of the tissue. Are you hydrated? Are you drinking enough water? One of the things, you know, we interview Dr. Stacy Sims of Osmo Nutrition. She's the preeminent researcher in hydration. She, you know, you know, ran the hydration at the highest level for Ironman and, and Tour de France stuff. She's out of Stanford. You know, and she's like, hey, look, the problem is that people are not absorbing the water they're drinking. They're drinking a gallon of water a day. You don't need that much water. You drink probably, if you're a woman, you probably need about two liters, men about three liters. But you need to put some salts in there so you can actually absorb the water you're drinking. So even a pinch of sea salt changes how you uptake your, uptake your water. So what we're seeing is that people are not drinking water. They don't have their electrolytes up. So their tissues become friable. They become mushy. They become more likely to get injured. All your ligaments and tendons have this viscoelastic property. It means that when you slam them or put them under load, they become very strong. But if they're mushy, right, because they're dehydrated, and then as soon as you hit them, boy, they don't get really mushy. Or they, they don't, they don't, they're not very strong. All your articular surfaces of your joints are comprised largely of water. So when you're dehydrated, you get a little bit mushy. So in fact, if you have, people have ever heard of like taking glucosamine, right? Glucosamine is kind of a salt. It's a glucosaminoglycan. And they think the proposed mechanism for that is that you eat this glucosaminoglycan and what ends up happening is that it, it's a salt and it pulls water into the articular surface. And so that's how glucosamine helps your articular surfaces. But if you don't have any water in the system because you're drinking coffee and you're stressed out and you drink water, guess what happens to all your tissues to that load? It's crap. So we sort of have to make sure that we're not eating like maniacs, right? And that's, that's, that's we can give some rough baselines. Don't eat sugar. Try to remove the dairy. We, you know, we advocate for fewer wheat-like grains. But, you know, I can handle dairy pretty well. I don't get diarrhea. I can eat some rice. That doesn't screw me up. Why I've had some genetic testing that tells me this. Does it mean it's optimal? No, it means that I can handle it. I have, some, you know, my friend Rob Wolf, you know, he drinks some, drinks some milk and his knuckles swell up, right? <laughs> like, that's a problem. So we, we're, you know, if you're not sleeping, you know, you're, you're, you're basically pre-diabetic for the next 24 hours. 
you know, you're immune compromised. I mean, your, you know, your cortisol is through, it's a disaster. So we have the, the requisite building blocks for the tissues. And if you are an athlete, you better take serious. I mean, I'm not saying I like John Berardi, the great nutritionist. He's like, look, once my macronutrients for my athletes have been met, putting a little ice cream on top of that probably doesn't matter so much if they can handle the dairy. You know what I mean? But are you eating like all these good foods or are you, are you eating salads as big as your face? And, and you know, what the problem is we, we now are getting to the place where I think people are getting comfortable with that. Then when we start talking about taking a systems approach to your tissue, we're looking for, do you have unimpeded full physiologic range of motion? So can you hold dumbbells straight up and down with your arm not bent without your shoulder internally rotated and over your head? If you can't, you don't have full range of motion. So is this a sliding surface fascia problem? Is this a joint capsule problem? Is it a mechanical uh, contractile tissue problem? Well, you know, and so we have to be treating in a system. I have to be addressing my own dysfunction in a system. So maybe I need to do some joint distraction, or maybe I need to do some trigger point on the muscle, or maybe I need to do some mild fascia work to address the slide surfaces, or maybe I need to do all three. And I need to know that that's actually a good range of motion when I swim. So it's crucial that we kind of think of this as a system of systems. How do we know a tissue is normal? It doesn't feel stiff. So if you push on your quad and it feels like beef jerky, guess what? That's not normal. If you lay on a foam roller or a ball or anything and compress your tissue and it hurts to compression, it's not normal. So we can tell that tissues are not normal when they're not stiff and when they do not hurt to compression. And comma, you have full physiologic range. Does that make sense? Yeah. But why do our Otherwise, muscles get tight? Talking? So Sorry. What? Well, I can come up with probably 50 reasons off the top of my head of why our muscles get tight. Are you sitting in a chair right now? Yep. There you go. Number one. You know, what pattern are you using? I mean, look, you've actually got your arms on the, on the arms mm -hmm. of the chair, and you're using your shoulders up by your ears. You're like, why did my neck get so tight? And you basically created a couple additional spines for yourself. That's what you're doing. You're basically anchoring your shoulders to your spine, decompressing your spine as you sit with your abs off, right? So yep. what, we, what we see is that your body is going to try to protect you. It can get stiff. <clears throat> How about the fact that most of us run our bodies like race cars and then just put the race car away, you know, piping hot. I ran at lunch and then I go sit down again. You know, I exercise in the hotel and then I jump on the airplane. And so what we've seen is that people have accumulated this stiffness from exercise, from training, from inactivity for a long time. A lot of times people get stiff simply because, you know, if you're moving inefficiently, then your body tries to stabilize you. So if you've got, it's like having a fender whopping in the wind as you drive down the freeway. What you do is you end up, your body's like, no problem. Let's just throw some duct tape on that. There's your fascia. Let's put a strap on that, strap it down. There's your muscles. And so now that thing is still loose and flapping, but it's flapping less when your body does the same thing. Hmm. So, so what, unfairness about it. Sorry, what was Go that? Ahead. I was just going to say, what, in your opinion, what does the ideal the workout unfair. look like? What are you doing? What's your point? If someone just wants to be fit, healthy, move better, what, what, what kind of exercises should they be doing? What does the workout look like? Well, what you'll see is that, number one, do you have a movement practice? Yes or no? Are you taking the body into all of the shapes that it needs to do systematically and regularly? So CrossFit says, hey, it's, it's, let's take these, these you know, multi-joint movements, these functional movements that everyone can kind of agree on. And let's make them almost random, constantly varied, functional movements. Well, what that really means is, are you, is your shoulder overhead? Is your shoulder coming behind you? Is your shoulder in rotation? And is your shoulder in the front rack? Those are basically the, what I think are the four basic archetypes of the shoulder. So you can get there a lot of different ways. Through gymnastics, through Pilates, through yoga, through a, a full kettlebell system. And if you look at what Pablo and Dan John have done, right, there's lunging, there's hip hinging, we've got squatting, boom, all three of the hip archetypes are set. Internal rotation of the kettlebell, overhead, front rack, right? And so all of a sudden, you've got all the shapes represented. So what you're going to see is that most people, if you, if you follow Ido Portal, he's basically said, here are the three things that the hips do. You've got to be able to spend some time in these shapes working this. Then, once you're making sure that you're actually touching those shapes, however you want to do it, yoga, Pilates, ego portal, CrossFit, right? doesn't matter. What does matter is then are you loading it, right? Are you getting, doing some strength work? 
you know, because Pilates is great with deadlifting. You get what I'm saying? Pilates is great with deadlifting hill sprints because, you know, not getting your heart rate up high enough. So what really we want to do is make sure that we're giving people a broad template of movements that systematically challenges these basic shapes. Can you keep your spine straight? Can you keep your spine straight when you run? Can you keep your spine straight when you lift? Can you keep your spine straight when you're, when you're uh, you know, jumping rope? Can you keep your spine straight when you, you know, and all of a sudden it's all challenging the same spinal shape, right? Well, can you do a, a forward roll and a backward roll? Can you do a kip, right? Can you slam a volleyball at the net? Can, you know, and so all of a sudden you're seeing, well, the spine has basic shapes too. And if we're not training those things, then we, as Greg Lassen says, we will fail at the margins of our experience. And the reason we fail is that we do not expose ourselves to the things that we need to be able to do systematically, regularly, and we do not challenge those patterns appropriately. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So I don't care what you do, but mm-hmm. you know, it, it, as long as you have a movement practice, I'm good. And, and don't confuse you know, exercise with a movement practice. Those are different ideas. Absolutely. So what would you say some of your greatest obstacles with you know, performing CrossFit have been? Oh, well, people have, have zero movement language. We end up having to teach people everything, you know? And so, you know, we know you can come in with your big lungs and your huge biceps and go for it, but that's not what this is. We have very few people who walk through the door, you know, and, and, and coaches have hit this before. Like, um, you know, CrossFit has shown us, you know, from the start that we needed to, you know, Greg was like, look, are you squatting yes or no? Are you deadlifting yes or no? Like, what are we even talking about? You know, we're not even, we're not even at a baseline where you're practicing basic hip hinging and pulling, stuff that you perform all the time. Dan John was like, hey, you know, there was a, he had a coach or someone who said, hey, you've got to be able to overhead squat your body weight 15 times. Well, no one comes in and overhead squats their body weight unless they've actually overhead squatted and working on these positions. Like, you cannot do it. And so I think the real problem is, we see that people are not skilled at all. They have zero skill. They played, they played you know, high-level soccer in college, but they do not have to squat, keep their back flat. They can't get up off the ground. They can't perform a burpee without hinging. They don't have full range of motion in their shoulders to perform a full pull-up, right? They press dumbbells over their head, shoulders are inch rotated, they're broken into the T-spine. You know, kettlebells, the same thing. Can't do a basic handstand hold. You know, Edith Portal freaks out. He's like, what do you mean you can't do a handstand? I'm like, what's wrong with you? I mean, you don't know how to fall? Like, what, what are we talking about? You're bragging about deadlifting 500 pounds. You can't even do a forward somersault. What's going to happen when you trip on the sidewalk? And you can see that the real issue is that we, people have done what we've asked them to do for generations. And suddenly, now the paradigm has changed. Everyone's fitness paradigm is looking more like the uniform by field theory where everyone is saying, hey, you've got to be able to do these things. Now we have GPP language that allows us to go out and, and do sport. So our, you know, our biggest issue is that people do not have basic skills. That's what we're teaching them in our on-ramps. That's why we're so meticulous in the way we teach beginners in our gym. And they don't even have the range of motion to be able to do this. You know, press two dumbbells over your head. Oh, you can't even do that. So what are we even talking? Why am I even teaching you jerking yet? You know what I mean? So we got to get to baselines for people to understand how far away from being competent baseline human beings they are. You follow me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So what have been some of your greatest success stories that you've seen? Oh, my God. Ah. Uh, the things I'm most proud of is the number of extraordinary coaches that have come out of our gym. Uh, really, really tremendous coaches. You know, we our our gym is like a collab, and the number of really talented thinkers and coaches out of that have been, and their ability to affect all these other people. The most important thing um, that we've done so far is we feel like it's really fun to work with the best athletes on the planet, but our real job is to work for the coaches and teachers of the world. And what we've seen is that if we give people better tools and the information to make better decisions, they will unequivocally make better decisions and become better coaches. And the thing I'm most proud of is we've given people the tools they need to solve their local problems in a sort of a communitarianism sort of way, and they solve it within their own community. Look, I don't know, you know, I've worked a lot in the NFL, but I'm not, you know, Dan Dalrymple, the head strength coach for the Saints. He can tell you exactly how much pressing a guy needs to do in season 
at week 13, I have no idea how much bench pressing you need to do to be able to also be fresh enough to bench press. You know, so, you know, I, I, you know, I work a lot. I'm really proud of the guys at Cal Strength. You know, it's a, it's a tremendous strength and conditioning, uh, you know, Olympic lifting community. They get people ready for the combine. You know, Dave is a genius at programming. I have no idea how to get an Olympic lifter ready for an Olympic lifter me right but i can tell you where he's giving away force or dumping potential and now as soon as that I, as soon as that coach can do it too he doesn't need me anymore and that's i think that what i'm most proud of that's awesome so i know that you spoke recently at dave asprey's biohacking summit what did you speak about there <laughs> well you know what i love about the biohacking idea is number one that there's an idea that like, hey, we can optimize. Hack is not the right word because that's like a cheat. It's a workaround. And for me, I think that's really a tough concept. You know, if I just take this pill, then I can not, not have to sleep much, right? And there's no shortcut. Alan Lim, who's the great exercise physiologist in Boulder, um, you know, so he's like, look, you cannot cheat your physiology. You can't. It's going to come due. The bill is coming due some point. And I think... You know, what ends up happening is we get enamored of some technology sometimes, and that tells us a lot about um, what's happening. For example, there's a lot of um, ways to measure your sleep quality, right? And we can look at heart rate variability, we can track omega wave. Uh, there's a new product called Bedit that looks at some of the mechanical issues of your heart, measures of that underneath your sheets while you sleep, can tell you how much you moved around. So, so, but it doesn't tell you how to improve your sleep. It just tells you you had crappy sleep. So that's a whole set of lagging indicators. So as I'm sitting in this conference, what I, what I looked out into this amazing crowd, really of people, is they're all slouching and sitting like dog crap in their chairs. They didn't have an understanding of how to get organized. They didn't understand their heads were in bad positions, that their bellies are off. And I'm like, what? it's sort of misplaced precision that as long as we're not paying attention to the vessel and have an idea of sort of always working on that shape and that basic construct. And these are old ideas. I mean, you know, Musashi, who wrote the book of the five rings, and we put this in our book, is like, your combat stance is your everyday stance, is what he said, like 500 years ago. I mean, that's, this was like an uneducated Japanese farmer swordsman, right? And he's saying that, hey, who you are when you fight is who you are when you stand. And there's, that should look the same. And who you are when you organize and sit should be who you are when you're about to run or swim or jump or do all these things. So I don't think people are realizing that there is a there is no difference between sort of the who we are all the time and who we are when you exercise. Those things are integrated. I don't shuck my like day to day self and become an exerciser or an athlete. I am practicing position because that is the best expression of human physiology there is. Awesome. Where do you get a lot of your information from? How do you stay on the cutting edge? It's a great question. Uh, you know, one is that I am a working physio and I am an active coach. And one of the great things about where we are is that I, I get to see behind the scenes of a lot of the, the systems in the world. So a lot of the, I mean, if you could, if I made a list for you, uh, we, for example, um, we were on 60 Minutes earlier this year, 60 Minutes Sports, and we he just followed us around for like seven months or something. And, and one day I was with the air force and then I'm with the pararescue at the air force. And then one day I'm talking to some guys at an office and then I'm with the blue angels. And then I'm, you know, <laughs> then, you know, and then I'm with this arsenal soccer team and then I'm with some, you know, footballers. And then, and, you know, then I've worked with this girl who got run over by a boat and only has one quadriceps. And my point is even our coaches were like, Holy crap. I didn't realize that you were out in so many different fields and because I get to see so much, I'm able to pick up patterns better. So that's been very, very fortunate for me. But I also get to work alongside with the best brains in the planet. And everyone who is making a difference and whose work is robust, incredible, is 100% transparent. They tell people what they're doing. They tell people what they're thinking. And our whole model is test, retest, share. So if you think you have a good idea, test it yourself and retest it, verify that it works, and then share it to make sure that someone else can test it and retest it and share it. And suddenly, you know, all you have to do is spend a few hours on the phone with Greg Cook or talk to, you know, the best Olympic lifters or hang out with Stacey Sims or, or work with Brian McKenzie or you're hanging out with Carl Powley. And 
you know, your brain is going to explode because there are so many people working on their own same sets of problems that we start to see how these things all dovetail. You know, there is a, you know, there's this sort of Buckminster Fuller has this concept, you know, where, you know, all of the systems have to integrate. And if you see a piece that doesn't integrate into the system, either the system is wrong or the piece is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's crucial that we understand that these are all basic constructs of the same idea over and over again. So are there any books that you're reading right now that you would recommend to the audience? Uh, you know, I read wide, widely. Uh, um, you know, some ideas come from a lot of very interesting things. You know, lately, if, obviously, if people haven't read The Sports Gene or The Talent Code or, um, you know, The Story of the Human Body by uh, um, the, the anthropologist out of Harvard, I'm blanking his name right now, but those are just wonderful places to start. Um, you know, I have Nikolai Romanov's new book about running technique. I'm just looking at that, you know, and there's so much interesting ideas. The goal is not to, the goal is to try to understand what coaches are saying and why they're saying it. And so that ends up being pretty profound is that if you can understand what's the intent of this coaching cue or this idea, then suddenly you have a really true model for, for improving your own coaching. So read, read widely, read, read, it's crazy how much you can get done. That's true. So what's one simple thing then you would recommend our listeners start with today to improve their health? Uh, you, need to, you need to start monkeying with your body to improve your position of tissue mechanics, and it's 10 or 15 minutes a day. Um, you know, yesterday, my, my, I was, you know, my daughter was, uh, my six-year-old is running track. She's a, like a running machine. She like, lives to run. And uh, you know, I was at the track waiting for her. My, my wife is with our other daughter playing volleyball, and I just brought one of my balls, and for, you know, an hour, I rolled around and I just, you know, found, found blind spots and dealt with st sticky tissue for an hour. Nice. That's awesome. So and I, 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 yeah, if you can, if you can bury it into your life, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of have one leg on the table, one leg off the table. I've been working on my hips the entire time I'm talking to you. <laughs> nice. That's a, that's a biohack right there. <laughs> <laughs> or, or comma, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I got, a, I got a busy, busy, crazy life, and I've still got to get it in because, you know, I, I, I practice every day, you know, and I think, I think that's the idea. There's this great book called War of Art. Have you read The War of Art? No, it sounds good. Oh, though. it's so good. It's like a takeoff on the art of war, but it's all about fighting resistance. And there's resistance to eating well, and the resistance to mobilizing, and you know, and ideas. You know, I think some of the really interesting pieces right now are. How do we create habits? And that may be the, 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 the best biohack of all is that, you know, The Power of Habit is an incredible book. Um, you know, how do we reproduce these sort of high-level states all the time? Um, if you haven't read Rise of the Superman, kind of talking about flow state, but it really is a habit about getting into these sort of super conscious states. That's, that's the magic, you know. So anyway. Awesome. So where, where can the audience learn more about your new book, Ready to Run? Well, it comes out on the 21st of October. Uh, Ready Run is on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, you know, we, we are on mobilitywad.com. You know, WOD workout of the day. The idea of you taking care of yourself every day is a sort of a, you know, seminal concept here, you know, is that there's no days off. Um, and that, uh, you know, we, we're there. And on Twitter, we, we're, you know, we're, there's so many people doing so much extraordinary work, and we try to aggregate some of that work and let our friends know about it. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> Great stuff today. De definitely one of the best uh, podcast interviews I've done yet uh, by, by far. So thanks again for being on Extrascribe Radio today and sharing some great information. My pleasure, man. Thanks so much. Awesome. Talk to you soon. If you haven't already, get your custom workout program by downloading the Exerscribe app from the iTunes App Store today. Mm -hmm.